One of the things I love about doing the shows here on the Armstrong Neighborhood Channel is the ability to talk to you about what's going on in your public schools. That's right, what's happening in that high school, in that middle school, in that elementary school nearby to you? What's happening? How are those teachers helping you, especially in this day and age of the COVID virus? Well, we have another superintendent that we're talking to today, Dr. Nathan Van Dusen, superintendent of schools of the Southeastern School District, the headquarters in Fawn Grove, Pennsylvania. He'll be talking to me, I'll be talking to him, and you're on point. Thanks for being with us here on Point. Ken Kudrowski here, glad you're there. And today we have the uh, opportunity and privilege to talk to another superintendent in the area who uh, you need to know about. You need to know this guy. He's new along the Mason-Dixon line from the Southeastern School District down in Fawn Grove. Nathan, pardon me, Dr. Nathan Van Dusen. Superintendent of Schools of the Southeastern School District. Nathan, thank you for taking the time of being with us here today on Point. Thank you, Ken. So it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you know, I had the pleasure to uh, to talk to your uh, predecessor there uh, maybe a year or so ago, but I haven't had a chance to uh, to talk to you in person, so. Uh, why don't we start out by you telling us a little bit about your uh, educational background, where you uh, where you learned the craft of education, and uh, we'll start there and, and we'll work into your professional career. Great. Uh, thanks again, Ken. Um, again, my name is Nathan Van Dusen, uh, superintendent of the Southeastern School District. Uh, my journey. Uh, I grew up in upstate New York, actually, um, and uh, went to college at Messiah College here in Pennsylvania. And after graduating from college, took a job down in Maryland for six years as an elementary teacher. At that point, my wife and I moved back up here to Pennsylvania, where I worked in the Cocalico School District for a number of years, 16 years, where I was a principal for 10 years and assistant superintendent for three years. Um, and then moved into this uh, this superintendent role here in the southeastern Di school district nearly two years ago so i'm finishing my second year and it really has been a blast um, from the educational side again messiah college undergrad i got my master's degrees at, degree at towson university doctorate at walden university and then a superintendency letter of eligibility at edinburgh okay so you've had uh... What did, what did you teach? I taught elementary. I taught fifth grade for nine years. Six nine years, years in, in okay. Maryland, three, three years in Cocalico in Pennsylvania. And, and I had eight years in the classroom, uh, a mixture of fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Now, let, let's see if you remember this name or it sounds familiar to you from being from upstate New York or western New York. The Guam Central School District. Ring any bells? What was that? Right. What, the Gowanda the Central School District. Gowanda. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, we uh, we were right on the border between two counties in Western New York, on Erie County and uh, Cattaraugus County. And 25% yes. of our population were uh, young people from the Seneca Indian Nation. Oh, wow. So mm -hmm. that... That made an interesting mixture and uh, a lot of neat learning experiences for both the Senecas and the people from the rest of the area, all the children there. So mm -hmm. it was a very interesting experience. But anyway, uh, getting getting back here. So, so you've been at Southeastern now for just over a year, is it? Uh, almost two. At, at 21 months, I started. Um, I'm, I'll be through with my second year in June. Okay, okay. And uh, so let's see, when uh, this is, did I understand that this is your first uh, real superintendency? You were an assistant superintendent before, was it? That is, yes, that's correct. I was an assistant superintendent in Cocalico. So this is, this is, the, this is my first experience as the superintendent, yes. Okay, so um, 
are you badly beaten up? Are you uh, <laughs> are you at home in the position now? Uh, how does it feel? Um, I, d I am at, I'm definitely at home in the position. I'm at home in the district. Um, you know, we have a really good team here. We have a, a, a strong administrative team, um, uh, great teachers, I think innovative with innovative mindsets. So I do believe that things have gone as well as they could have during a pandemic, you know, uh, year this year um, and really into the end of last year. So I, I feel like we've, we've really made lemonade out of lemons. Um, and it's basically, it, it's been a mindset shift for us. It's, it's our ability to kind of, um, you know, uh, not focus on the problem, but look past that problem and look at solutions so that we can move forward throughout the whole thing. Um, you know, I think of uh, v Victor Frankl wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning is a, is a great example about how, how, you know, we're supposed to how important it is for us to focus on the response rather than the stimulus. And I think that's really what we've tried to do this year. We've really tried to look at this as a learning opportunity and a growth opportunity, you know, in the midst of uh, this pandemic. You must have had more than your share of meetings with all the uh, stakeholders in the district. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, they must have been all virtual meetings, I, I would assume. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so I can imagine some of the things that people were saying to you. Overall, how do you feel? I mean, uh, I mean, where did you get the most uh, heat from, if you will, if you want to talk about it? The, the staff, uh, the, the, the uh, community, where did the heat come from? Um, I think it's, it's the Ken, it's kind of shifted. The heat has shifted a little bit. I think from the beginning, you know, March 13th took us all by surprise last year. Uh, you know, we're just about a year away from when this whole thing started. Um, and I would say initially in that first year, my first year, that the heat started really with the parents and community, more specifically, you know, the senior class, uh, you know, because, you know, when the governor shut down the, the state, basically things like spring sports, proms, um, you know, a regular commencement, baccalaureate, all those wonderful things that a senior has at the end of the year, or any high school student has in the, at the end of the year was gone. So I think, um, you know, from a parent's perspective, there was a lot of, they went through the stages of grief, you know, so, you know, like any parent that has a senior is going to start with anger until, you know, it takes a while to get to that acceptance stage. So I think it, when you talk about heat, I would say at the beginning, you know, those first few months up until June, I would say probably from the parent community standpoint, because at that point, it wasn't really an understanding of really we're working within a box as, as school administrators. We're, we're doing what basically we're told inside that box and, and not going outside of it. Um, and then I would say we moved into the summer and we really put a good plan together for our reopening uh, uh, time um, and worked really hard as an administrative team to, to come up with a comprehensive plan that really met the needs of our students and our, and our parents. Um, and so the, the, the heat then changed a little bit. I felt like there was a, a real deep, strong uh, support from our community. And I have to say this too, Ken, Along this, along this whole road here, in, in what we went on, we had a very supportive board of, uh, of directors. Um, so they were kind of walking beside us all the time, uh, giving us input and feedback. Um, so you know, it, it, and so what I'd say is, once the school year started, um, and and kids came back to school because you know we did give some uh, opportunities to parents to make some choices on what was best for their child and what, what was best for their family. Um, I would say then, you know, some of the heat then came from the staff because it is a heavy lift and, and there was a lot for um, us all to do, including our teachers. Our teachers have done just such a phenomenal job, but it, but it has been difficult because of, you know, our reopening plan. So um, I don't think the heat has been in one particular group, group Ken, but it, it's kind of shifted throughout the school year. But I will say that I felt very supported from our community, from our board, um, and really with, even within our team, I felt very uh, supported. As you know, I've already spoken to uh, a number of different superintendents this year on this program about COVID, and each one has brought different ideas and 
concepts about dealing with this uh, this terrible virus, uh, how it's affected education. I like what you said. It's an interesting concept, what you just brought out. I don't know if you did it, if you know what you did, but you compared it to, well, you said grief, going through stages of grief, having, having been hit in the face with a situation, as people do when they're going through grief, they're hit in the face with a terrible, terrible, a life-changing situation. And for a young person, this is a life-changing situation. What do you mean I can't go to school? <laughs> instead of instead of them thinking, I want to cut school, I want to cut this class, they're thinking, How, what do you mean I can't attend class? And the parents are saying, well, what do you mean they can't attend class? And why and is it is it because of the governor is it because of dr fauci is it because of this virus what are the reasons and, and if we can't attend class what are we going to do so they would indeed have to march through these various stages of grief if you will i like the way you said it for them to accept what has to be done okay we're in this situation now now how are we going to march through it to a logical and good conclusion for the benefit of the students and for the benefit of the community at large. So I think I think some of the things that we did over the summer, we had a, a separate graduation ceremony like in July. So we had a virtual graduation ceremony, which um, went really well, but then but then really we, we stuck with our word and we said, if we're allowed to have an in-person graduation ceremony in July, we'll have one. So we had a second, uh, a first in-person, but a, but but I think that that brought also uh, some support from the community because they could see then, hey, we're saying what we were going, what we said initially, and we're standing behind it because we want to do what's right. So I think that also helped to to get to that acceptance stage of, of the grief process. Um, and I, I don't think we've left uh, really from that stage. I feel like uh, uh, parents at this point accept uh, the deal that we're that we're living in, you know, where kids are quarantined and and, and things like that. So, um, so I think we're in a good good spot with the community. Okay, now uh, I think it might be fairly well uh, labeled as news to a lot of people to know that your staff is going to be completely vaccinated very, very shortly. Is that true? Yes, uh, Governor Wolf rolled out a vaccination plan on, on uh, Wednesday. So the last couple of days have been very busy as we're trying to uh, figure out the logistics of the vaccination rollout plan for our staff, um, because it's coming really quick. It's gonna actually start March 10th. So. We're working on information to get it, that, that information out to teachers and then uh, put together uh, databases to share with the IU who will be setting up the logistics of it. And am I also correct in the information that uh, they're going to be receiving the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Yep, I believe uh, 94,600 doses of Johnson & Johnson were uh, specifically given for educators in the Commonwealth. Um, now, from what I understand, uh, they're not moving educators into 1A, but they're keeping educators separate and using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, in an effort to uh, vaccinate them. And I think Ken, we, we don't necessarily fall with this because we've had kids back from the first day. Um, we haven't been closed, but it's an opportunity for the Commonwealth to try to get uh, kids back to school. It's my understanding that about 40% of the Commonwealth is still uh, in, in a virtual setting. Um, so I think they're looking to try to get as many um, teachers and students back to school as possible. Okay, for the sake of those people out there who do not have students in your district, uh, are you fully back right now or are you uh, half and half? What's the status of your education right now? Ken, we, we took a different approach than you've probably heard. We put together last summer. So as an administrative team, we worked countless hours uh, in sub in subcommittee work, figuring out how we could do right by our, uh, by our families. We basically, and, and let me start with this. We started with uh, uh, in June and July, and we started with basically coming up what, with what we called our, our just cause or our why statement. And it's basically, it's been very beneficial to us because uh, 
it's kind of given a, us a target with all of our decisions. It's simplified, honestly, Ken, it's simplified um, the whole process and all the decisions that we're making this year. Um, we distilled basically the, the activity that we did comes from Sinek, Sinek, Simon Sinek, Start With a Why book. Um, but we distilled all of what we do as educators down into our purpose for doing it. And that would be our why statement. And we, we distilled that down to a short statement that SESD exists to impact and, and inspire. And so we, we consistently asked ourselves, how can we impact our kids and how can we, uh, uh, we inspire our kids? Um, in doing so, we came up with the idea to offer options to parents. So parents basically had three options, actually four options. We would be open for a five day full week uh, brick and mortar experience for those parents that um, had to work um, and their kids needed uh, to be in school. We also had uh, two virtual options. We had a, a, we have an asynchronous option, which means that um, students work through at their own pace, they work through the content. And we had a, a, a synchronous option where kids could actually zoom into classrooms and still be connected um, with the classroom via Zoom. Um, and lastly, we also had a, a, a hybrid option where students could come to school two days a week and then be virtual three days a week. So we gave all those options to parents. Um, I would say from your question about your percentages at the beginning of the school year, um, we had uh, about 60% of our students that were fully back and then about uh, uh, 20 and 20 that were hybrid and virtual. And at this point, we're up to 80. We're about, we're just under 80% of our students are fully back um, with about, uh, I think it's about 15% that's virtual and about five that are hybrid. So we have shifted. It does seem like things are getting a little bit better. Um, we are seeing transmission rates in our county and uh, in our school district specifically go down. So what, what's happening there is, is kids are starting to come back. So Nathan, during this time, you must have had many opportunities to talk to your staff and they must have had many opportunities to talk to you about what they really need to make this whole thing work. Uh, you know, things for the classroom, extra technological things, just everything to make this whole new experience that no educator in the past 100 years has ever had to deal with before. So what have they cried out for? Uh, Ken, I, I, I would say a lot of things. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned this year, you know, when, when we did focus, I talked a little bit about that just cause and our focus being on inspiring and impacting kids and, and meeting the needs of families. Um, that, that, that puts a heavy toll on the district and specifically our teachers and our, and our building level staff um, because they're asked uh, and tasked to, uh, to do many things um, here. So um, what I would say is definitely the technology. Um, we've had to learn a great deal. You know, when you move into a Zoom environment, um, you have to learn how to use uh, the Zoom or Screencastify if you're making videos or the technology that it's going to take to be able to teach somebody virtually is something that's totally foreign to us as a basically brick and mortar institution. So I'd say that that was definitely a hurdle that, that we've worked through. Um, professional development's another one. What, and one of the things that we did this year, Ken, is we pushed back, we changed our calendar uh, in August, uh, knowing the heavy lift that we were going to begin, we pushed the student day back, or excuse me, we, put, we pushed the first student day back. We put all of our staff development days up front. We added three act 80 days, and then we did half day Wednesdays for our teachers to be able to collaborate um, in an effort because we knew, as you said, like a staff development is needed, that teachers are gonna need time to be able to connect with one another, to be able to prepare and plan for the next week simply because um, uh, basically things are being done so radically different than they were in the past. Um, and I think right now what we're doing, Ken, now is we're having stakeholder meetings uh, to start looking at what this looks like next year. Um, in, in, you know, and that's the biggest thing I've learned from, from this whole process is that we have to look at this, and I and I use this sometimes with the staff as a detour tour, where we're off on a detour on this pandemic year, but we have to use and utilize the time that we're off on this detour to learn and grow and become a better as an organization. So when we get back on, we're even better for our students and our staff. Um, so that's really our focus now, and we do have stakeholder groups. We have a, a, a teacher stakeholder group looking at basically the question of sustainability. 
you know, some of the things that we're doing this year, um, like having our high school and middle school teachers teaching virtually and to kids in the classroom at the same time, we've realized is not sustainable. That's not a long-term strategy. So we have a, a, a teacher stakeholder group that we have working right now on how do we sustain this in future years? Because we do think, and we know from survey data from uh, uh, parents, that between five and 20% of our parents are gonna continue to want that online experience and have some of the same flexibility that they've had this year and some same voice and choice. Um, so we're starting to build that now. Um, and because of the time, because we've been given some time here to start plan, to, to plan, um, we're able to really pull our teachers in to, to help us make decisions for moving forward. Well, you're not a doctor and neither am I, but if what I read and hear in the news reports are true, that by the time summer ends, if uh, people keep on getting vaccinated and social distancing uh, stays strong, uh, you might have a fairly normal opening in September, perhaps, maybe, fingers crossed. What do you think? Um, I, I don't think there is. I, I think there's a new normal, Ken. I, I, you know, I think of that quote by Henry Ford. Uh, you know, I would have asked if, if, if he would have asked what people wanted, he would have said faster horses, um, you know, before he made that first Model, Model T car. Um, and I, I think the same thing here. I think we have learned this year so much about how technology can create efficiencies in our workday that our education system is not going to be the same. You know, it really aren't, it really isn't. We had, for instance, one of the one of the highlights this year was um, our numbers that we had for uh, parent teacher conferences at elementary, middle, and high school. We had higher numbers at our middle and high school than we ever have because we are now doing them virtually because uh, parents have the efficiencies uh, the efficiency of of logging in and meeting with a with a teacher for 15 minutes um so i think we've created some of that those those things that we're never going to go back to so i think what we're looking at now ken is we're looking at a new normal based on you know those those successes and things that we've learned this year um in in an effort really to create a better system that's going to meet the needs of of our kids and our uh, families here in the in the community i think you just answered my next question and that was what do you think you've learned from the pandemic that you will carry over into the future and uh, you just gave an example there of having uh conferences online there are probably other things with the technology that you've been either been using or forced to use that'll come into play in the future that'll give uh, an extra dimension to your program at the southeastern school district so i think that that's that'll be very true so now as far as the superintendent of this school district is concerned how are you sleeping at night, buddy? I'm sleeping pretty good. I, I, I'm I'm doing pretty well. Again, I have in. I'll take this back to our board. I, I have a. We have a very supportive board, innovative group um, that's been you know supportive of of all the efforts that we've had. Uh, so you know when you have a supportive board, when you have a a, a great team when you have a supportive community, there's no reason not to sleep, you know. Um, this, this, you know, it, to, to some extent, this is exciting, Ken. Um, you know, the things that I thought about a year ago before the pandemic hit, um, we're light years ahead from an educational perspective of where we would have even thought we were in the conversations that we were having at that point. So I think what this has allowed us to do is, is maybe change our vision a little bit and look forward into more innovative ways that we can educate uh, and be more successful. Um, so I don't uh, honestly, Ken, I don't look at this year as a, a, a black spot or a negative. Yes, it was difficult. Um, you know, it's that quote, it's it, it's not the load that carries you down, it's it's the way you carry it, you know. If we're able to carry this load and we're able to look at that, uh, you know, the negative and see beyond the negative and see a solution, I think that uh, there's, there's success in all that because with any solution, there's always gonna be a hurdle for us to jump over and we have to realize that. Um, so once we're over that hurdle, we've grown and, and we've gotten better as, as, a, as a team and as a community here. 
Well, you really summed everything up wonderfully well in your final statement there, Nathan. I, uh, I, I'm very happy for you that you're approaching it that way. And I hope that everybody in your educational community and the entire district understands the way you, your administrators and the Board of Education are approaching this because uh, hopefully they, they really appreciate you guys with everything that you've been doing to make, again, to make things better for the students and the community at large. So Dr. Nathan Van Dusen, Superintendent of Schools of the Southeastern School District, right along the Mason-Dixon line in a beautiful, beautiful Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for being with me here today on Point. Thank you, sir. And since we've been talking about education again today, uh, here's my lesson review. I know there are some teachers out there who say, gee, isn't that great? He's doing a lesson review. Yeah, so here's the lesson review. We were talking to Dr. Nathan Van Dusen of the Southeastern School District, and, and Nathan then brought a different perspective to this whole deal about teaching in a pandemic. And uh, I have to bring up again the point that he brought about how so much of what happened during the past year was like somebody going through grief. I mean, they were hit in the face with a terrible situation. And now what are you going to do? How are you going to cope with it? How are you going to deal with it? What do you mean I can't go to school, said the students? What do you mean they can't go to school, said the parents? And all that. And how the superintendent, along with the administrators and the teachers and the Board of Education got together and put together a program a situation where the students can continue to learn. And more importantly, for the future, they've discovered things that they'll be able to do in the future that will make their programming for education even more dynamic in the future after we move away from the virus. And that's the best. Learn from this situation to move on, to improve. And that's the story today. I'm Ken Kudrowski, and you've been on point.